Good morning, Grove family. It is great to be in the house of the Lord. This season is just so full of joy. I know that I'm feeling it. I hope that you're feeling it. How about you worship with us this morning? Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. Heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature. We will sing, sing, sing. Joy to the world. We will sing, sing, sing. Joy.
time the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken by Quirinius, who was the governor of Syria. All returned to their ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in snuggly strips of cloth, and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory shone around them. They were terrified. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You'll find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by the vast host of other armies of heaven, praising God, all of them saying, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. 
when the angels returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem and let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried in haste to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was a baby lying in a manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angels said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. Mary kept all of these things in her heart, and she thought about them often. Then the shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, because it was just as the angel had told them. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. In sin and never pining Till he appeared And the soul felt its worth A thrill of hope The weary world rejoices For yonder Glorious morn Fall on your knees O oh, hear the angel voices O oh, night divine When Christ was born, oh, night divine, oh, night, oh, night divine, truly he taught us to love. His gospel is peace. Change shall he break, for the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. of joy in grateful chorus raise me let all within us praise his holy name Christ is the Lord oh praise
Christmas story was written and retained for us for two reasons. One, to share with us the beautiful truth of the salvation of Jesus, the salvation that is offered to all men, every single person. But it was written for a second reason in a very particular way. The Christmas story was written to share the gospel, how salvation is available to each and every one of us. That starts at verse 7 of Luke chapter 2. 20 verses, the Christmas story, the gospel, how it is available for all people of all kinds, is available to everyone in his deep love for us from verses 7 to 20. But the first six verses share an often overlooked emphasis and priority for why the Christmas story was written. It was to declare two things. That even though the gospel given to lowly shepherds and all people of all kinds, starting at verse 7 all the way through verse 20, Prior to that deliverance of the gospel, the scriptures wanted us to know that Jesus, the one who is offering this good news, is King of kings and Lord of lords, and he is in total control of this world, of what he chooses to do in it, and your life too. So the gospel is clear. A little baby came to this earth. It was God wrapped in flesh to offer salvation and forgiveness of sin for all mankind. And in that little baby, you were able to kiss the face of God. He dwelt among his own. God in that little baby, lived a perfect life, showed us how to pray to the Father, showed us how to commune. He loved on his own creation. He healed his creation. He gave him samples of his power and said, now my ultimate demonstration, if you thought coming to earth as a human being was something, I'm going to take on the sin of the world, and die for your sin, and I will conquer sin and death and rise again and if you believe me and call upon my name, I will forgive you of your sin, and we will forever be in heaven, by the way, where I started. So the gospel is a beautiful story of salvation. But what makes that story so compelling and should give all of us who have put our faith in Christ great confidence is because it was orchestrated and planned sovereignly and providentially by the creator of the world who started time, by the creator of the world who declared how creation will be. And not just in his power and right and in his sovereignty did he start this world, but he has every right to enter his creation. And while he's entering his creation, he has full authority, the wisdom and right and the power and the plan to be able to orchestrate circumstances to prove to you that he is in utter control. The birth of this baby was never threatened, though man tried. 
The plan of salvation was never going to be thwarted, not even by the world ruler at the time, Caesar Augustus. And so in verses 1 through 6, we get a behind-the-scenes look at how God had orchestrated sovereignly, providentially orchestrated even the actions of Roman leaders to fulfill prophecy and to bring about the birth of the creator of the world. So then when we get to the gospel message, we have already learned by verse 7, my king that came is in total control. He, there is nothing that happens outside of his will. He is forever able to schedule the world's events. There is nothing that blindsides him. He is in total control. His plan was perfect, so I can trust his plan of salvation. And on top of it, as a believer, I can trust that he holds me in his hand and I don't have to worry today. He has you in his hand because he was always in control. I'd like to take you a behind-the-scenes look at the first six verses. I'd like you to see the sovereignty and the providence of the creator of the world. Next week, we will share that familiar story of the shepherds, and we will see the beautiful gospel, but it will be undergirded by the fact that we have been persuaded this week that God is in control, and he is creator, he is sovereign, he is providential, and there's no one that will thwart his plan, and he can totally orchestrate, he is in total control. This God who came to earth in the form of baby was certainly not helpless. He was divine. And as a result, as we leave this building today, we can rest assured that just as sovereign as our God was, that he was in control of his coming to this earth in the form of what we think is a volatile little human being, he was in total control, never worried about the threatenings of his own creation. And he is in control and powerful to save your soul, and he is powerful and in control to take care of you today, no matter what you're dealing with. I'd like to take you to the first six verses. This is a peek into God's divine plan. Many of us have memorized the Christmas story. Many of us have read it. We've seen it. I want to encourage every single one, you will hear the gospel message on Christmas Eve. We are blessed to learn that NBC will not play our service once, but twice, actually, on Christmas Day, 6 a.m. and 8.30 a.m., and I just want to encourage you to tune in if you're interested as you're starting your Christmas Day festivities to listen to the Christmas service we had last week. And I also want to encourage you, there's another opportunity to hear this beautiful Christmas story on Christmas Eve. The entire Metro Richmond area is invited to come into this place. Christmas Eve, 4 p.m. You'll be out by 4.55 to enjoy that time with your family. That is another time that we will focus on verses 7 through 20. The beautiful gospel message, and it'll be an incredibly fun time. We assume this place will be very full, so please come early. We'll advertise on social media when we'll get the doors open for you. But I'd like to reread verses 1 through 6 and then rehearse God's sovereign plan. Verse 1. At the time, the Roman emperor Augustus decreed a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken by Quirinius, the governor of Syria, more like a leader. It's, it's not a formal title. All returned to their ancestral towns to register for the census. You've already seen three details that society has uh, implemented that people should follow. You have a decree from Rome, from Caesar. You have a local ruler running the census. And then you have this requirement to return to your ancestral town. So there's a lot of details. Listen, Micah 5.2 said that the Messiah would be born specifically in Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Genesis 35 calls it Ephrata. Literally Bethlehem. So the birth of the Messiah is going to happen in Bethlehem. Now, if you put a census where everyone has to go to the required place, 
uh, believers probably are hoping that this all works out. Because the emperor has a census. There's a deadline to it. You have a local leader who we're going to learn historically had run another census before. They had a Jewish rebellion that could delay the requirement of the census, which we'll learn in a moment. We hear from Matthew. And then you have to go to your ancestral town, and we'll learn that if you own property, great. If you don't, you don't have to come. Mary did not have to come. Probably Joseph did. We'll see in a moment. So there's a lot of requirements that would logistically in the human mind say, wow, all of this has to come at just the right timing to get that Messiah born in Bethlehem. And odds are, Mary and Joseph had, at this point, not even thinking that they need to hurry to Bethlehem to make sure that Micah 5.2 is fulfilled. They're just looking at the calendar. Verse 4. Because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem. Notice he. He had to go. In Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth, Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary. We're going to hone in on that very intimate moment. If you were nine months pregnant, would you want to ride... 90 miles on the back of a mule. Now, I remember when we had children, we're like, I just want this baby born now. And we heard all kinds of remedies. Bumpy car ride was one of them. 90 miles, though, that's something else. He took Mary. We learned from Matthew and Luke that she was a descendant of David, but unless you were a landowner, you didn't have to arrive to the census. Or you could send representation. But he took Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. Let me define for you two terms that I've already used, sovereignty and providence. In Scripture, you will see these the providence term, Describe, you'll actually see the word sovereignty in Scripture. Uh, sovereignty, the sovereignty of God means that God has the power to do what he wants to do and the right to do what he wants to do. That's sovereignty. The power to do what he wants to do and the right to do what he wants to do. He's the creator. He can do what he wants with his creation. Providence is God has the wisdom and the plan to do whatever he wants. Providence is not miraculous. Providence is not supernatural. Sovereignty and sovereign acts insert God into the natural created order and rules and laws of, that he had, like gravity walking on water. That's a sovereign, miraculous, supernatural act where he inserts himself and disrupts the normal order, and that is truly a miracle. Providence does not adopt the miracles. Providence is that God does not disrupt the normal plans, but in his wisdom and his divine plan, he orchestrates the consequences and the thoughts and the actions of man so that man is positioned exactly where he is, who he is, with whom he is, and exactly what he wants him to do. To me, that's pretty miraculous. We're going to see in verses 1 through 6, providence. He does not make the Caesar acknowledge, hey, I need to pull the census so I can get the Messiah to Bethlehem and so that it can be born so the Jewish people can be really satisfied. He's not interrupting. He's using the natural order. Caesar had no idea what he was doing, but God did. Quirinius had no idea what he was overseeing, but God did. Mary and Joseph probably did not quite put two and two together that he must be born in Bethlehem, but they get confirmation by shepherds while they were there. Those shepherds play a very unique role. So you have providence involved. Providence in this way as well. At the 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 the. Decade, the year, 30, 33 AD, however you date it, the decade that Jesus was born, or zero, or 6, 6 BC, depending on our calendar, 30 was the resurrection and the cross. At the time he was born, say, our calendar's a little off, 4 BC, 6 BC, our calendar's a little off, some say zero, but around that time, 
there was something happening in the culture that was significant that Luke write these words. Let's go back to verse 1, and I want to show you that not only the providence of these details, getting Joseph and the Messiah to Bethlehem, but also the environment, the providential environment that Jesus declared he would be born. Look at verse 1 again. At the time of the Roman Emperor Augustus, notice those two words, emperor, some versions say Caesar, Caesar Augustus, he decreed that a census should go out throughout the Roman Empire. So here's how decrees happen. They originate in Rome. They literally go out. They have what's called heralders. They go out. Judea, where if you go to the Mediterranean, the whole Roman world kind of surrounded the whole Mediterranean area and the whole Aegean Sea and all the way to you know, Italy and Rome and then all the way to the Middle East where you have Egypt down there. The whole Roman world was occupied and under the control of Rome. Judea, which is the region where Jerusalem is in Nazareth and all that area, that is, as the crow flies, 1,400 miles away. Now, that's a straight line. you got to go up to Antioch, got to go over west. It's probably 2,000 miles. So you have a decree by the emperor, which probably occurred if Jesus was born, per our revised calendars, at around 4 B.C., uh, that decree, we do know, happened at 8 B.C. We know that for a fact. Because Rome at the time had censuses uh, every 14 years. We know for a fact, with great certainty, there was one at 6 A.D. Even Egypt had one at 6 A.D. So every 14, you go, 14 years, you go back, you have it at 8 B.C. Jesus was born at around 6 B.C., 4 B.C., somewhere right there. So you have a decree in 8, and the Messiah came on the scene at around four. So you're like, so there's this decree. There seems like there's going to be a problem. Is, is he, is, 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 are, they, are they going to have a census to pull him back to Bethlehem and Joseph isn't even engaged with Mary? I mean, some suggest he's 15 and she's 14 or 14, 13. I mean, they're not even thinking marriage. So if everyone thinks that once this decree happened, everyone did it. There was a lag in time. There was usually, usually two years for the entire empire to comply, especially those that are at the farthest length, farthest away. Then you have a little bit of a revolt uh, because Rome allowed um, different areas to um, kind of hold their own religions and old beliefs. So when Rome said everyone in the Roman Empire has to come to a census for military, the Jews were already granted exemptions to that. So that's why we know this was not a military census to find out who can be soldiers because Jews, Jews had a peaceful agreement. We, we don't fight against your military. You're a Gentile. We're not going to fight against it. But so we know this one was for taxation. Uh, that's why we know Joseph was probably a landowner because he had to go. Mary probably wasn't. So you have the decree. You have a 1,400-mile distance. So you had two years to comply. But the Jews in A.D. 6, you can read in Acts chapter 5, verse 37, you can read that the Jews revolted and there was a huge battle. They even described of how they killed the revolt people that, that argued against us. Herod, who was in that area, was employed by Rome, didn't like Rome, and actually revolted. So they postponed some uh, censuses and some taxations for another year or two. So you have Caesar in AD, uh, 8 B.C. saying, you need to go to your ancestral town, Bethlehem, in this case, or wherever you're at. They have a two-year permission to comply. The Jews revolt a little bit and extend it, and it is assumed by historians that at this time, Caesar had had enough and said, stop it. Here's your date. You need to get there. By this date, I've had enough. A la April 15th, so to speak. He's like, Done. I'm through with you guys. Now you have a deadline to get to your ancestral town because the Jewish people first had delayed their complying per the law, and then they rebelled a little, and finally there was a need that by this date we better get there. We don't know the date, but people traveled to their ancestral areas in haste in the Jewish area. So now there was compliance, there was a date, there was a delay, a little rebellion, and finally they're like, now we have to go. And it just happens to land at that moment that Mary is 
carrying the Messiah in the virgin birth. So, she's nine months pregnant. Bad timing. So how are we going to get there? How are we going to, how are we going to do all of this? Um, take yourself in Mary's mind. Joseph, don't go. I'm so, class, so close to giving birth. I can feel it. Joseph, don't lead me. Honey, I have to. All of this is, I have no choice. Our people have stalled enough. We have no choice. What would you do? Young family? Some people think you're lying. It's just you and your husband and let me go with you. It's not ideal. I know it isn't. Just let me go with you. She has not a lot of support at home. A lot of people are still wondering, which, by the way, I'll give you a sneak peek to next week. Those shepherds sure put Joseph's mind at ease because I bet you that he even believed her, trusted her, took her as his own. He heard in a vision that it was of God. But when you, there's probably 1% of like, is this really true? And can you imagine after your baby was born, all of a sudden these strangers come and say, you don't know us, but I just saw all the heavenly hosts and said, I need to find you here because they told us who your baby was. <laughs> Joseph's like, no more questions. Those shepherds really helped the heart of Joseph. But here's what's happening at this Caesar Augustus. Follow me on this. This is beautiful. And I'll just share some few details of history. Caesar Augustus, Emperor Augustus, is not his name. It is two titles. Caesar, emperor, is where you get the word king. There's a bunch of Caesars. Augustus is often mistaken as his name. It is an adjective. We have the same adjective in English, august. If something is august or someone has an august presence, it's more seen in literature. We don't use it kind of in common vernacular. But it means impressive, respectful, majestic, august. So Caesar Augustus is a description of this guy. So who is this guy? His name, born September 23rd, 63 B.C., his name is Gaius Octavius. His historians call him Octavian, so you'll hear that a lot, Octavian. Gaius Octavius or Octavian. He was born to a mom named Attia. Attia was his mom. Attia's mom, her name was Julia sister of Julius Caesar. So Gaius Octavius is the grand nephew of Julius Caesar. For some reason, Julius Caesar took very nicely and warmly to this boy. At 20 years old, Julius Caesar decided to adopt his grand nephew as his own son and declared he would be the heir of the empire. So at age 20, he learned he was adopted and he was adorned with gifts and authority. One year later, when Octavius, Gaius Octavian was 21, Julius Caesar was murdered at 2 Brutus, if you know that, his friends betrayed him. At 21, when he learned that Julius Caesar had declared that he would be heir of the Roman Empire, he changed his name to Gaius Julius Caesar. But he did not become the immediate heir to the Roman Empire. That took 13 years later. He was still a young man, 21. There were three people leading the Roman Empire. There was this man named Lepius. There was Mark Antony, great military guy, and Gaius Julius Caesar. Octavian, as we will know him. Lepidius, he, he fell out, so it was Mark Antony, and Gaius, Octavian. They ruled. Mark Antony married Octavian's sister. So there was a family, a strong bond. And then something Mark Antony did that upset Octavian, he said that I am um, going to divorce your sister because I'm enthralled with another world leader that I have been engaging, and her name is Cleopatra. He began in Egypt to 
visit with her more and not be around and began to compromise the military security of the Roman Empire and start to fund and resource her resources. Love drew him in and he began to support Egypt more than Rome. That was compromising the security. So these two leaders of Rome went to battle. Egypt went to battle with Rome in a great sea battle. Egypt was not prepared. They were prepared for land and sea. And Octavian, Octavian won the battle handsomely when he was around 31 years old. When he won, Mark Antony and Cleopatra and all of Egypt came be behind and came under the Roman rule. Roman rule absorbed the entire wealth of Egypt. Shortly after, Mark Antony and Cleopatra committed suicide. That left Octavian, Gaius Julius Caesar, as the sole ruler of Rome. He ruled for 45 years. He was known as the most profound, still is today, the most profound leader in Roman history. Four years into his reign, he's in his 30s, four years into his reign, he brought about military security. He brought a wealth like no one had ever imagined. He brought a road system and he knocked down the borders of all of the countries that they dominated. So like states in the United States, you could walk freely. He let a travel path and made sure there were efficient ways to go from the farthest end of the Roman world to the next, to the, all the way to Rome. He made it so that you could walk and you could transfer and you could, you could have, he started an imperial mail system. He allowed for information to travel far and wide. Four years into his rule, he established what's called Pax Romana, Roman peace, unheard peace in the world that the world had never seen before. So they deemed him entitled Caesar Augustus, a term that means majestic, royal, holy, holy. It was only used of God's until that man. This Caesar, anything he said, was divine. Every coin, every standard on the trophies, every impression of this man. He was called Caesar, king, majestic one. There was an inscription found on pottery right by one of the ancient writers and historians. In 1764, we learned that they attribute to him another title. Caesar? Augustus? Grateful for the great peace you have given us? The Savior of the world. So, to expand his kingdom... I declare we have a census that everyone should go back to their own town so I can collect the revenue in the census for my kingdom. And the majestic one, in his desire to build strength and human peace, with his own tongue, fulfilled Micah 5.2. The Messiah will be, must be, born in Bethlehem. This virgin birth conception, he carries his daughter on a 90-mile mule ride. They go to Bethlehem. A census takes you 60 minutes. 
we can go home now. Do we go? Do we stay? Do we do this? Do we stay? Well, where do we stay? There's nowhere to stay. Do we go? Do you want to come with me? You can stay, honey. You get, we just have to go. They've delayed enough. There's a deadline. This should have happened two years ago. We had two years to comply, and then our Jewish people revolted. Come with me, Mary. I know it's hard. I don't want to leave you. You have no one. So the Savior, the true Savior of the world, gets carried in great humility and in the birthplace of the Messiah, the Messiah is born and all of heaven breaks loose saying, Jesus is the Savior of the world. No matter what we try to do to thwart the plan of God, God has all the circumstances in line. This baby, while he was traveling through the birth canal of his mother, was holding the world together, folks. Philippians chapter 2, verses 6, 7, and 8, that says that he was the creator of all things, and he was born just like men are born. Colossians 1, 17 says that in the creator, all things hold together. John chapter 1, verse 14 says that the word became flesh and dwelt among him. That means that if the creator of the world was the creator of the world and holds it all together, then that means while he was being born, this baby was holding the world together in his hands, and he's holding your your life together in his hands too. The savior of the world did not get the audience of Caesar Augustus, the savior of the world, but you know who did applaud him? The lowly people in life. The lowly people that people discarded. Mere shepherds that people just looked down on. He found in swaddling clothes in a feeding trough. And his only audience were people that could not get to that manger fast enough to say, we must see this miracle that has come to pass. And his audience, that quiet night, was all of the heavenly hosts saying, we know, we know who the true Savior of the world is. It is Christ. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, the Eternal Father, the Heavenly One, the Mighty Counselor, the Prince of True, True Peace. Let's praise His name today.
Thank you for joining us today. We invite you to watch this and other Victory Hour presentations on the Internet by visiting groveav.tv. Please remember that this program is viewer-supported. It's your prayers and offerings that help us meet our airtime expenses. If you would like to help, you can call us at 804-740-8888. Or you can write us at 8701 Ridge Road, Richmond, Virginia, 23229. We hope that you have been encouraged by today's program. Please join us again next week as we gather for worship, for prayer, and for Bible study, live on the Victory Hour. this into a house of praise this morning, whatever posture is conducive for you to just offer your praises to him. You can stand, sit, kneel, doesn't matter what I do or anyone else does. Praise him. Give him due praise. Praise him for who he is right now. Praise him that he is the true giver of peace. Peace to all people. Thank him that he peace in this world is not contingent on man or circumstances. But we run right to the Prince of Peace when we need peace in the time of need. Thank him for that. Thank him for the peace that you have in your heart as a child of God. Thank the peace giver. Praise him. Praise him. Commune with him now in your own heart, in your own way, in your own words. Thank him, praise him. Praise him for your salvation. Praise him for resolving turbulence in your life. How, how often do we not return to him for that and say thank you for resolving and making peace? Praise him that you have a peaceful family if you do in your situation. What a blessing. Praise him that he has given peace to so many people in this room and watching peace with God. Praise him for that peace. The Prince of Peace. Glory to God. Glory, hallelujah. God, we offer you praise. Oh, Lord, how we did not deserve your gift of peace. God, how we have often run to man and government and laws and our own Caesar Augustuses in our life to bring us peace, economic peace, political peace, social peace. We run to you knowing you are the source of peace. All other sources will fail us. All of their results reflect your goodness. Thank you, Lord. Praise be to God. Now in the quietness of your heart all across this room and all watching, 
I want you to commune with your creator and I pause because it's such a familiar prayer request we've done in this place this year. Promise him you will trust him. I don't know how else to say it. He is worthy to be trusted. He is king of kings and he is in control. That means whatever you're dealing with right now, he's got this and he's got you. If he can orchestrate the coming of himself to this world, and if he can providentially orchestrate all the details, consequences, and decisions of man in entering the world as a baby, he has certainly got your work week this week. He has certainly got your family struggles in his hands. This Prince of Peace is not surprised or taken back by your circumstances. He is sovereign, providential, and he knows exactly what he's doing. So trust him. Trust him. Pray right now. Lord, may I trust you. I was reminded in your word to trust you. I will trust you. As the psalmist in 139 verse 10 says, Everywhere your hand will lead me, and your right hand will hold me. I trust you. I trust you. Chad. Father, King of glory, your majesty the fact that we can walk into your presence and just be there is completely unfair. The fact that you love us is completely unfair. Lord, we are so unworthy. But not only have you allowed us to walk into your presence and just be there, which is all we would ever need, you allow us to talk to you We can ask, we can praise, we can thank. Lord, you even listen to us complain. But Father, right now we praise you. We praise you for who you are. Lord, the things in this world that we consider majestic or powerful, They pale in comparison to you, God. Jesus, you came here as a baby in the most humble state one could possibly be in. Yet you were the God of the universe. And you still are the God of the universe. Jesus, you are still with us thank you thank you for that truth Lord for those of us who know that remind us of it right now continue Prince of Peace to give peace to those who know you but Lord if someone does not know right now that you are in fact the Prince of Peace that you are in fact the God of the universe who came here to save. Lord, bring them to you now. Lord, this this Christmas season is special because what you did will never get old. It will never become just a tradition. Our lives should demonstrate every day our gratitude for what you've done. Bless your church with the endurance to proclaim you and who you are, Christ and Christ crucified every day, both with the way that we speak and the way that we live. Jesus, we love you. We submit to you, King of glory. In Jesus' name, amen. With your heads bowed, would you just sing this little chorus we just sang? We'll give him praise forever. We'll give you praise forever. We'll give him praise forever. Christ the Lord will give him praise. We'll
Prince of Peace. I found myself here uh, one late night this week praying for you that you would know the Prince of Peace. And we find ourselves today in the very spot <laughs> celebrating his majesty with you. Praise be to God. On behalf of the Grow family, I want to thank each and every one of you for coming. I know that many of you are traveling this next week, and I just want to say, please, safe travels. Call me when you get home. I want to make sure you got home. Uh, you call Chad. I do. You want your cell. Uh, <laughs> but please be safe. On December 24th, we already have been pushing out on social media and to all of the community, many business leaders, uh, many people, and I want you to invite them to come December 24th, 4 p.m. We'll start right on time. You will be out at your cars before five o'clock so you can enjoy the time with your uh, families. Um, last week, we had the highest church attendance since COVID began. And we are grateful that God's bringing people back. We're grateful that people are, they are hungry to worship together. It's not about numbers as much as it is about having our family back. And so I want to encourage you to come uh, this Sunday. There are many guests here. I want to encourage you. We have a gift for you, actually. You, trust me, you don't want to miss this. If you don't get your gift, I'm going to take it. That's how good it is. Right by the Welcome Center, just go out there and tell them, Pastor Ben sent you out there. Um, if you haven't visited in the last year, maybe you came a few years ago, but if you haven't come here before in the last year, we'd love to uh, make your acquaintance again or, or meet you for the first time by our Welcome Center. God bless you, folks. Uh, if we don't see you, have a great holiday. If not, we'll see you next week and definitely on Christmas Eve. Have a great day. Thank you for joining us today. We invite you to watch this and other Victory Hour presentations on the Internet by visiting grovav.tv. Please remember that this program is viewer supported. It's your prayers and offerings that help us meet our airtime expenses. If you would like to help, you can call us at 804-740-8888 or you can write us at 8701 Ridge Road, Richmond, Virginia, 23229. We hope that you have been encouraged by today's program. Please join us again next week as we gather for worship for prayer and for Bible study, live on the Victory Hour.